Hi, 8th graders. Welcome back. I hope you guys had a nice, relaxing spring break. Um, we are going to jump right on into it with the rise of industry or the beginning of industrialization. Um, in the 1800s, we're going to start looking at it from about 18, the beginning 1800s, 1806, um, up until about mid 1850s. And then we're going to go into the Civil War here coming up next. So um, real quick, I just wanted to show you my screen here. Um, this is the rise of industry notes template that I posted on Monday. So if you click this, you can see everybody has their own. Um, so I'm just going to click this right here and you will see that you can type in the notes that I'm going to do over this like quick lecture. You can type them into this document on your own. So, um, since obviously I did not realize that we are going to be out of school for this long, I did not get a copy of these notes to you. So here is kind of my little alternative. If you like like handwriting, obviously go ahead and get these printed, but if not, um, go ahead and take them on here. And this is how we're going to take notes um, from now on for the rest of the school year. So hopefully this is a little bit easier. I know a couple of you requested these before. And then on Fridays, I will put my answer key for these notes up um, in case you missed anything. And then also the PowerPoint. So um, going right on into it today. Oh, also real quick. Um, going back to Google Classroom, I also posted the homework, the North's Economy. This is due um, Friday, April 24th or this Friday. So um, just real quick, couple things right there. So let's go ahead and dive on into it. The Rise of Industry. Um, and right here, this is a steam engine locomotive, um, also known as a train. And this is a pretty big um, industrial in, uh, invention that we're going to go into today. So real quick, starting off, um, as I did this PowerPoint, I highlighted what you should type or write in your notes template in red. I think that might make it a little bit easier, especially um, with these notes. Some of them are already filled out for you. So I just thought this would be a little bit easier if I try something new. Um, so we're going to go into the three productive resources needed for industrialization. So these three things are really important. Um, every aspect of industrialization or rise of an industry um, in any successful economy um, could go into these three categories. So it'd be human resources, also known as labor, which you can see on the picture on the right. Um, capital resources, which are building. Um, so building materials, building um, factories, building machines, building things like that, um, tools, materials, and money, and then natural resources, which are um, a, a productive resource, including like land. So the primary ones that we're going to look at, especially with the rise of industrialization or this beginning, this um, strengthening of the industrialization, we're going to focus on human and natural resources primarily, but also with capital resources. So real quick, our first industrial invention that we're going to look at was invented by Robert Fulton in 1807, and this is the steamboat. So obviously, um, you might think, okay, it's a boat, very cool, but this was a boat that um, was kind of, it was moving without as much energy by human labor as, as before. So instead of rowing or... Um, kind of like paddling, things like that, the type of boat. Um, this was a lot easier to transport. Um, you could obviously trade easier. You could put more things on the steamboat. And so this was kind of a big invention because it led to um, like an advancement, like a, hu a human advancement and made life a little bit easier. Um, so this was a big industrial invention in 1807. The next one is the steam engine locomotive, which was that picture that I had um, at the very beginning. And what I wanted to show you, which I think is really cool, is um, this was invented by Peter Copper, 1830. So make sure you put that in your notes. But this picture is actually tied to a story. I'm going to click on this link that I posted here. Um, in 1830s, when this was invented, in order to test kind of the agility and the speed of the um, locomotive, they decided to race it against a horse and carriage. So um, this was pretty interesting. Uh, the battle between steam and horsepower marked the moment when the Industrial Revolution changed transportation forever. So um, this goes into a story about um, Peter Cooper and his um, locomotive engine that 
was um, we're supposed to race this horse and carriage because obviously this new like change in technology and advancement that people had seen in this locomotive was not something they were prepared for. Obviously, they were more trusting in this horse and carriage versus all this like crazy technology that no one had been um, familiar with yet. So they raced the two together. Um, during this specific race that they say in history, which some say didn't even happen, but as the story goes, um, Peter Cooper did not actually successfully beat the horse and engine because they had a malfunction, um, but with the actual uh, locomotive, but in theory though, obviously a locomotive would have lasted longer and further and would be easier to rely on than a stagecoach. So um, that was kind of the story behind that that I wanted to share with you guys. I thought that was very interesting. Um, let's see. So moving on with our notes, um, the next industrial invention relies on um, a big advancement in communication. That was the telegraph um, invented by Samuel Morse in 1844. And obviously the name uh, Morse should be familiar if you look at the Morse code. And if uh, anyone that is familiar with the Morse code, that is a pattern of taps or ticks that um, translate into um, letters on the alphabet right here, which you can put into a sentence. So for example, you would use this machine right here and you would push on this part right here and this part would make a like a certain tick or a tap. And if you did like one quick tap and one long tap, that would signify the letter A. If you did three short ticks and then one long tick, that would be the letter V. So they would use this to kind of communicate and transport messages um, from different distances. So this was pretty big when it came to communications. Now, if you look at this, how amazing it is that this has evolved into the iPhones and the Androids that we text on today. It's pretty insane how this has evolved. Um, another big thing that has to do with the productive resource category of land or a natural resource is the steel tipped plow invented by John Deere, 1837. Um, this is right here. It allowed you to plow large portions of land in a much quicker rate than was currently available. Um, and we're going to look at later kind of what agriculture looked like versus in the North versus in the South. And in the South, people primarily worked on farms. So being able to use the steel tipped plow and have it drawn by horses, um, let you pl let would allow you to plow land um, much quicker, which would lead to you being able to um, grow crops faster and gain a profit quicker with less energy and time being wasted. Um, another thing that had to do with the natural resources industrialization is the mechanical reaper um, by Cyrus McCormick in 1834. Again, this was an even bigger technology um, advancement because it would allow you to um, like uh, harvest grain at a much quicker rate. Um, you could hit an entire farm in one day versus tackling it in different sections or acres um, through multiple days. So you're able to harvest grains at a much quicker rate. Also, it's easier um, and less labor intensive. Um, so this was a big like industrialization te uh, technology advancement. One thing that you guys should be kind of familiar with or that you've heard of before is the cotton gin, which was invented by Eli Whitney. Um, and the big things that you need to know about the cotton gin was that it had interchangeable parts so you could put it together and um, kind of like put it back together. It was like a little bit more um, user-friendly, and it could clean 50 pounds of cotton per day. So the cotton gin, and when I say gin, that's actually short for engine, um, not gin like the drink. So you would put um, these cotton balls, um, and if you know about cotton in a field, it has these, it's like this fluffy white little fuzz ball, but there's like seeds in it. So you would put these cotton balls from the farm into this part right here, and then you would crank this lever or the engine would crank the lever on, lever on its own and the seeds would be cleaned out and then the clean cotton would come out on the other side. So this would be a way to produce cotton at a much quicker rate. Like it said right here, 50 pounds of cotton per day was um, pretty drastic. So cotton being a huge cash crop in the South, especially for Southern farmers, this was a huge um, boost for that kind of agriculture and that economy. So real quick, um, last thing we're going to do today is look at that graphic organizer at the bottom of your notes. We're going to look at northern workers versus southern workers. So the big thing that I want you to see is, um, especially think about this image, was child labor laws and protection um, 
for workers happening in the north. So an average workday would be over 11 hours um, in the 1840s, which is pretty drastic. Most contracts in most employees will only be able to work at one job for eight hours. And no matter what kind of job you have, if it's a like a federal or a local or a state job, you are required to have certain breaks after so many hours and also a lunch. So I know that my first job when I worked at a grocery store, I had to, I was um, forced to take a break or forced. I mean, I obviously wanted it, but you have to provide breaks for your employees certain times. Um, you're not allowed to let people work for over like eight hours in one day at one, com- at one company. I mean, obviously people get second jobs and they work larger shifts, but on average, there's lots of guidelines today in the employment where you're only allowed to work so long to make sure that you are provided rest, um, time to eat, time to drink, a chance to use the bathroom. So this was not what work was looking like in the 1840s. Um, there was no child labor laws. So the second that you were able to stand and use your hands pro- and feet properly to kind of provide for your family, you were doing this. So this is actually something that if you look at different cultures, um, many children at incredibly young ages will help provide for the family and work and earn money, which is pretty drastic because in America, we put a lot of um, pressure on students in, like, in schools and to receive an education, but in other cultures, school is not viewed as such an opportunity or important, and they go right to work right away and earn money for their family to kind of contribute to the household. So um, the fact that there is no child labor laws, kids were young, they were working the entire day, um, and they were trying to provide for their family like everybody else. But this was also incredibly unsafe. Um, risk of injury, as no safety precautions were available, there was no things like OSHA or safety hazard laws. So obviously, like if you kind of lost a hand into a cotton gin machine, that was kind of like, oh, you're a foul kind of thing. There was no protection, no eyeglass protection, no gloves, no um, things like that that you would normally see in a, like a day-to-day business. And then women and African-Americans were discriminated against and paid for less than their white and male counterparts. So you kind of see um, a gender pay gap or salary gap in things today, but not as extreme as you would then. There was no regulation. There was no um, jurisdiction or justification to make sure people were paid equal or even close to equal. So you could be doing the same exact job as the person next to you, but there would be a ginormous difference in pay based on your gender or your race. And um, immigration, just wanted you guys to kind of see a lot of these workers were coming and immigrating in from Ireland. So that was kind of what the North was looking like at this time in the 1840s. Next, we're going to compare to Southern workers. Um, Most worked in agriculture, and by agriculture, I mean on farms, um, manufacturing, things like that, that involve natural um, resources and human resources, so labor. Uh, Most Southerners did not own slaves and owned their small farms. So while you think um, Southern usually is attached to slaves and plantation, there was more or less few Southerners that owned many slaves versus every single Southerner owning a slave. So um, think about it in the way of there was lots of tiny farms um, that usually, you know, a family would tend to themselves, but there was larger farms called plantations that had numerous amounts of slaves and um, just to one specific owner or master. So keep that in mind when you're thinking of um, kind of what agriculture and farming and plantations are looking like in the South. Um, They also had a heavy reliance on slave labor for mass production of crops. So we talk about those cash crops like tobacco, um, grain, cotton, things like that. So in order to get these things out and produced and profitable at a very quick rate, um, they relied on slave labor or human labor for this mass production. So um, this is all we're gonna cover today. We will move on to the back of this graphic organizer on the back tomorrow or Wednesday. So make sure that you're answering the do now and make sure that you're working on the homework that's due Friday. All right guys, hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you soon.